Patel. I'm the director of Spark, based in Mumbai, and uh, my organization works with the National Slum Dwellers Federation in Mahila Milan in many cities all over India. Spark is not the central actor of this process. What we are is actually a uh, part of a continuum of actors between the state and the community networks who are trying to reformulate the basis of the Dharavi plan. So starting from where you were three years ago, there was still the huge challenge of what to do with the bids that had come in from many different developers to redo Dharavi. Because as you know, it was divided, it's divided into five sectors and they had about 19 bids and they were going to check out who was going to get those bids. Well, because of the whole crisis uh, in the international housing markets, uh, most of the bidders backed off and there were only five bids left. And it was clear that you can't give five bids to five people. It doesn't work that way. And during the discussion about whether the bids were on and what to do with it, uh, there was a growing uh, pressure from community groups and uh, those of us who were part of the technical committee that was uh, now part of the government machinery advising the Dharavi program saying that it was very important, first of all, not to take all the five sectors at one shot, that it would be too risky. You can't upheave the lives of five, six hundred thousand people at one shot. And since such a big redevelopment had never been done anywhere, our recommendation was that they should try in one of the sectors before planning something out, which was like a minimalist negotiation, conceding that you can't kill it, but you can try one at a time. And the other strategy was to suggest that develop a new master plan for Dharavi, allow the design work to be done by one set of professionals that you hire. And then once the design work is done, then develop different permutation combinations of what volume of work will be taken up. What happened over a period of time was that uh, because of the time sensitive nature of the uh, bid period, the time went on for too long and it lapsed. So the bid issue has been closed now. And uh, the government is suggesting that they would take what is known as Sector 5, uh, where most of the land belongs to government. And there are the least number of households in that locality. For that to be taken up by Mahada and the DRP, where they would bring in somebody to do the design work for it, and then MADA can take out a tender for specific construction. So in a way, they've picked up our concept of doing, uh, getting some group to do the planning, and then MADA would do the construction. That's the plan. What the residents of Dharavi are suggesting is based on our work on Re Dharavi, we've divided sector four, which with some variations on the roads, to be divided into six sections based on contiguous informal settlements. And we've act and the and thirteen community groups in section one of that group have actually worked out detailed plans of how they'd like it. And we are telling the government you give us permission to take that forward and have a, a have a architectural firm then do detailed plans with communities 
and then either we can take up the construction and get a bunch of people to finance it or the government can tender it out because neither the communities nor we have any problems about who does the construction but we're very concerned about how it's going to be designed who's going to stay where how long it will take what happens if something goes wrong I think in a complex situation as the Dharavi's redevelopment program is, there are different forces pulling the government in different directions. There's a deep and desperate need for the government to earn a big pot of money, which they would earn through the auction of the land, which would be useful for their development work in other parts of the city and the rest of the state. There's no question that that pot of money would be very attractive. There's a desperate need from a political and a election point of view to do something in Dharavi because doing and not doing become electoral issues. There's a similarly a deep concern about not doing anything that would upset the residents of Dharavi because there's a very clear understanding that they can take a series of action that would embarrass the government. And I think our role in all this was to, to, to stay on course to make sure that the project didn't start. Because, you know, once a process starts, it's very difficult to stop it. But you can stop it before it starts. So if you ask me what is the qualifying concept of success in our case it was that we didn't allow it to start and that was not only because of terrific things that we did but a lot of things that happened in the course of the last three years and by major major sustained mobilized communities that were giving this message to whoever came so I think those were the ways we'd look at it uh, I can't think of anything we could have done which would have been a smarter choice of action. Uh, because our experience has shown that uh, these kinds of issues, if they could have been solved by straight talking, they would have been sorted long time ago. Several things. First of all, a big part of the seven billion story is how many of them are going to be in cities. The second one is that if you look at the range of cities in the global south, many of the cities in the north are joining us as well, the landscape of informality is growing and the inability of cities and their planning structures to accommodate this informality is actually shrinking when it should actually expand. So you'll have a city plan that doesn't encompass about 50 to 60 percent of its population. Because they're illegal, they're squatting, they don't fit the norms and standards of the city, whatever. So for me, those two are the most significant and serious challenges that we face. The third one is that a significant population in, in this urban uh, informal settlement process is a dominance of people below 30 years. And it produces a completely different dynamic of what their aspirations and expectations are compared to the earlier generation of either migrants or poor people who were born and brought up in the city. They don't have patience, they have great aspirations, and they can quickly turn to violence. And those are critical issues that are not being understood. So if you take all these things to, into the Harawi, if you talk to younger people, they're very impatient at how long all this is taking and they want quick closure to whatever problems are there. The older people are very fearful because they have seen histories of displacement and uh, prolonged 
you know, um, torturous development processes that never work for them. And if you look at the densities in Dharavi, they're probably some of the most dense places in the world. So it also reflects about what happens when cities don't look at informal settlements early on. You know, when, when people have just moved into a locality, the city can make choices of addressing the land issue. It can make choices about providing everybody with basic communities and services. And it can negotiate for densities, for rules and regulations, for things people have to do to be included. And the longer it takes, the more difficult it becomes. So I think those are the kinds of things I would connect to what's happening in Dharavi. And it's a very good example of what not to do. You know, yesterday at the, uh, at the lecture that Castell gave, there was a very interesting differentiation between what social movements do and what revolutions do. And social movements attempt to bring to the notice of their governments the things that are being ignored. And that's what social movements have been doing all along. And we think that's what we do. We support and assist large numbers of people to bring to the attention of government things like their duties and responsibilities that they haven't been doing. And what's happening now is that a lot of, a lot of societies and a lot of countries in which there was a measure of security about what you could expect from the state. There's a lot of disillusionment about that. And there's a feeling that, that the state does not see its commitment to fulfilling its obligation to its citizens as its priority. And that's what people are doing. And usually politicians tend to ignore this until the water reaches their noses. And I think the media, in many ways, is distorting a lot of what aspirations these people come with. It's like in all, all processes, if you, if you listen carefully to what, what these outraged bunch of people are saying, there's a lot that governments can learn about what to do. But they usually don't bother. And if you look at a lot of media, it, it's so easy to subvert that into making it demonic and negative and terrible. And that's what's happening right now. And that's a serious mistake. I think most of us are beginning to appreciate the value of this. Special. For us, it's more through mobile phones. The access to internet and computers is still not as prolific as it is elsewhere. I mean, there are cyber cafes and things like that. But the phone, the mobile phone is a very powerful instrument. We, I don't think we use it as smartly or as efficiently as we can. But I think we live in such dense and connected environments that if you look at the quality of communication that goes through these groups, while it can be terribly enhanced with new technology, there's a degree of politicization that comes out of face to face. So we're looking at ways by which you can balance the two. I don't believe that just um, just this sort of cyber communication by itself is great. I think it has to be balanced with relationships and with... I mean, one thing is to be getting lots of information. But I, I think it's the combination that's going to be more powerful. I don't know how it's going to be achieved. Maybe I'm not part of that generation, but I know lots of young people who are struggling to bring the two together in our network. 
Chau, besi.